with us um, in our seminar, Professor Hamutal Slovin. Professor Slovin did her BSc in biology at the Hebrew University of Jerusalem and graduated with honors. She won numerous awards already during her graduate and undergraduate studies. She completed also an MSc in medical studies and then continued to a PhD in neurobiology, which she did in the Department of Physiology at the Hebrew University under the supervision of professors Hagai Bergman and Elon Vadia, investigating Parkinson's disease. She did a postdoc in Professor Amiram Greenwald's lab at the Weizmann Institute of Science. Her postdoc investigated brain activity using voltage sensitive dyes. She then, um, she then continued to work as a research associate at the Greenwald lab and after that joined Barilan um, Gonda Multidisciplinary Center for Brain Sciences where she is now faculty. She leads the Neural in, um, Imaging Laboratory at the Gonda Center. Uh, Professor Slovin investigates the neural mechanisms at the visual cortex that give rise to visual perception. She also investigates artificial vision and the contribution of eye movements to visual function. Her research also tries to decode visual content from brain activity. She published dozens of papers in top leading journals as Science, Nature Neuroscience, Neuron, Journal of Neuroscience, and many others. She also published several book chapters on these topics that she investigates. And today we're very pleased to have you with us uh, to hear about your research. So welcome to our seminar. Um, thank you, Sharon, for the kind um, introduction. And thank you for the great opportunity to present here today. So the title of my talk today is Encoding Local Stimulus Attributes and Higher Visual Functions in the Primary Visual Cortex um, of the now, uh, please feel free to uh, interrupt me at uh, any step of, uh, of the lectures. And I guess that you see well my slides, including the mouse, which is now traveling in this slide. OK, so I'll start with um, uh, a brief introduction about the main tasks of the visual system. So natural images are comprised from key features, such as surfaces and, contour and contours. Process they interpret and to process and interpret the information in images, the visual system needs to detect contour and surfaces and combine them together to create coherent object. So for example, uh, in this uh, picture of the environmental statue, the visual system uh, needs to detect the contour of this uh, of the color tube and also the contour of this uh, color splash over here. And then the silver surface over here, as well as um, the red surface over here and combine these features together in order to create the coherent object of a, a color tube. The next, um, um, the next task of the visual system is to do uh, or to perform it, to perform an object uh, from background uh, segregation. So essentially in this case, um, the visual system needs to discriminate or segregate the color tube from the skyline, from the houses of the city behind, from the uh, sea and the seashore and so on. And a similar process is down for this uh, clothespin over here, which needs to be segregated from uh, the green park uh, behind it. Um, so um, in some cases, the figure ground segregation process can be quite challenging. So for example, over here, it's really, it's really difficult to see that there is an object over here actually in an all, but once this all actually uh, turns uh, its face towards us, you can see that there's two big eyes over here and now we can recognize there is an all, although it is quite difficult still to perform here the figure ground segregation. Uh, due to the similarity between the local features of this animal and the tree behind it. So once we have a coherent object and the object was segregated from the background, the next challenge of the visual system is actually to perform a figure-figure segregation. So in this image, for example, where we see multiple objects, in this case, we see here several monkeys that are taking a hot bath um, uh, in the winter. Uh, so the visual system needs not only to recognize the object and segregate them from the hot bath behind them, but uh, also to segregate between uh, the different object um, um, a mechanism or a process that we termed as figure-figure um, segregation. 
So the outline of my talk today actually will refer to uh, the tasks of the visual system and I'll go along the line that I have just mentioned. So I'll start with encoding and decoding of surfaces and contours. And then um, I would like to show you that uh, luminance surfaces hold some unique features and I'll speak about encoding and reconstruction of shape contours at some bigger resolution. Then um, the second topic will be uh, on electrical stimulation in the primary visual cortex. Recently, our lab became interested in artificial vision. This is also related to uh, the first uh, topic. And uh, the final part uh, of my talk will be on the perceptual processing, the relationship between the objects and the background. Specifically, uh, I'm going to address um, uh, two studies that we did in the lab on figure from background segregation and figure from figure segregation. So uh, this is a, a very brief uh, reminder about the visual pathway uh, to the primary visual uh, cortex. So light that is coming out there from the visual field is traveling through the lenses of the eye following on the back of the eyeball on the retina where it activates finally the uh, ganglion cells. The axons of the ganglion cells then travel to the first stage in the thalamus and from there information is traveling uh, through the optic radiation to the primary visual cortex where we're going to uh, focus today. Now um, uh, the primate visual system actually is comprised from um, uh, several tens of uh, visual areas which are highly interconnected. Many of the connections are feed forward, but there's also many top-down influences, namely feedback connection uh, between the various areas, including to the uh, V1 area. And uh, these uh, feedback connections are thought to mediate higher uh, visual uh, perception uh, processing. So um, in order to um, uh, measure brain, um, uh, brain signal, we use uh, long-term voltage sensitive dye imaging in the behaving monkey. So essentially over here, you can see an image of the blood vessels pattern from one of our optical chambers. And um, what you can see over here are several um, visual areas, the primary visual cortex, the secondary visual cortex in area V4. Uh, and this is a view from the top. Uh, on the cortex. So layer one is actually um, uh, on the top over here and the rest of the layers are actually, in, in, uh, are actually entering into the image uh, if you wish. Now, um, in order to collect the data, what we do, we stain the cortex with uh, voltage sensitive dyes. These are small organic molecules and uh, these molecules penetrate into the cellular membrane of neurons uh, transducing changes in memory potential in these neurons into changes in fluorescence. So essentially the voltage sensitive dye signal that uh, we measure uh, from each pixel uh, here in, um, in, 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 in the optical chamber uh, reflects a population response. It is the weighted sum uh, of membrane potential from all neuronal elements from the upper layers of the cortex. Um, it emphasizes subthreshold activity, but reflects also uh, superthreshold um, activity. So we see here essentially the entire membrane potential from one population. And the main advantage um, um, of this technique is the high spatial and temporal resolution. By high spatial, I refer to the mesoscale, namely uh, tens of micrometer per pixel. And uh, the um, uh, spatial resolution and temporal resolution that uh, we are using in this animal um, is uh, depicted over here. So um, let me start with um, uh, the uh, first uh, uh, topic of my talk, and this is encoding luminance surfaces. I would like to show you that um, even this very simple and basic visual stimuli holds unique um, features. So um, contrast, we know, our spatial contrast provide important information on the environment. So if, we, for example, we take um, these uh, faces over here, this image of faces, and we decrease the contrast, we gradually lose information. And V1 neurons are very well known to respond mainly to contrast, but less is known about the processing of positive, namely white, and negative, namely black, surfaces. 
So we set out to find out the uh, population responses or encoding of this kind of uh, stimuli in the primary visual cortex. And um, another motivation uh, for this study is that uh, the perception of a surface is affected by its edges. So psychophysical studies show that the perceived brightness of a surface is influenced by its edges. So for example, uh, over here, you can see these two patches, these two circular patches. And this patch appears over here to be brighter than this patch over here. However, if I remove the background, you can see that these two patches actually have equal physical properties. Um, so uh, it is the background and the effect of the background or the edges of this uh, surface stimuli that actually generate this uh, visual illusion. Um, another um, good example is the corn sweet uh, illusion. So I hope that you are able to see over here that we have here two surfaces and the surface on the left uh, looks brighter than the surface on the right. Uh, however, if I mask the, the middle edge, you can clearly see that uh, the two parts of the surfaces are actually identical in their brightness. And over here, I plotted uh, the special edge, the special central edge over here that um, actually caused this uh, type of illusion. So what was the behavioral paradigm of the animal? So in this case, the animal was simply fixating and we presented them with black and white squares, the size of two by two degrees. And um, we then uh, went on to measure the voltage sensitive dye response. So uh, these are the voltage sensitive dye response that uh, are developed shortly after the onset of the visual stimulus. Uh, this is the time in millisecond. And now the depolarization or increased population response appears in red colors, whereas in blue, you can see that there is no change. So essentially what we see is that following stimulus onset, there's increase of response at the edges of the squared surface, whereas in the middle, you can clearly see that there is a decreased response, uh, sort of like a hole, which seems to uh, be filled in at later times. This is also true for the white square that you can see over here. Again, shortly after the onset of the visual stimulus, we can see first response at the edges. In the middle, we can clearly see a hole which uh, tell us that this, there is a lower activation over here. And uh, again, it seems like there is gradual filling in, although to a lower extent for the white um, stimulus. I brought here two uh, short movies uh, that further show this phenomena. So over here, you will be able to see the voltage sensitive dye response. And um, time is shown over here. Here we'll see the stimulus as it appears. So here the stimulus comes and we can see the response appear at the edges and then information or activity gradually goes in. This is for the white square. Again, we will see the response starts at the edges and there's a hole in the middle. It fills in, but not to the same extent as for the black square. And we can quantify this by taking, for example, a region of interest. So this is the stimulus. We can take a region of interest on the edge of the surface, which over the cortex will be here. And then another region of interest, which will appear in the middle of the surface, which over the cortex will appear over here. And then we can compute the time course of response. And this is shown over here. So what we can see is that for both type of surfaces, the uh, response at the edges rises first and, um, and the response of the um, neural activation in the middle of the surface uh, is somewhat delayed growing um, slowly. Um, so we wanted to characterize this phenomenon. So what we did, uh, we looked again into the maps of the voltage sensitive dyes and we took a spatial cut over here. And then we plotted this spatial cut as function of time. Note that these two position over here are corresponding to the edges of the surface square. And the red line over here is actually corresponding to the middle um, of uh, this uh, surface, the center of the surface. And what we can clearly see is that following the visual stimulus onset, there's increase of response at the edges um, of the surface. And as time goes on, we can see that activation gradually grows in into uh, the uh, center uh, of the surface. And we can plot the spatial profile of this activity pattern. And the slope over here 
uh, will tell us uh, the propagation velocity, we can, which can tell us something about the mechanism. And when we look about, and when we look at the uh, at the slope over here and uh, the the speed, we uh, found out that the speed is around uh, 90 millimeter per second, which is well within the range of horizontal connections that the activation in the middle of the square actually is arriving from the edges, which I previously mentioned are actually influencing uh, or affecting the perception um, of the brightness of the surface. So at this point, um, I will switch to the next topic, which is encoding and reconstruction of shape contours at sub-degree resolution. So what we wanted to do in this project is um, to uh, look into uh, image decoding. And image decoding comes actually in two flavors, um, reconstruction and classification. Recon reconstructions means that you need to recreate the stimulus with greatest details possible. Um, whereas classification tells you that you need to find the image category or choose from candidate which image actually was um, uh, the most similar uh, to uh, the uh, created stimulus or the original stimulus that uh, uh, the animals saw. So uh, what we wanted to do uh, in this study is to perform image reconstruction, a pixel-wise image reconstruction, use a brain-inspired modeling, uh, no image prior, and uh, use the voltage-sensitive dye response from the primary visual cortex. So uh, the behavioral paradigm is again a fixation paradigm. The animals are fixating. And what we're showing them is all kinds of uh, shape contour circles or squares or, or bars at uh, various uh, sizes and eccentricities. And um, so what we're seeing over here are the stimulus type that were presented uh, to these animals. The um, location in the visual field are shown over here. So most of these shapes appear in the parafovea region. And over here, you can see the size of the shape uh, varying from 0.8 to um, about uh, two degrees, uh, for example, for this square. And uh, over here, we can see the uh, average voltage sensitive dye map that was evoked by these uh, shape contours. And for example, for this circle over here, we can see an elliptical shape that appears over the primary visual cortex. And uh, for the small square over here, we can see a square-like shape activation uh, in, uh, in V1. Um, we, we, we then wanted to see actually what is going on in, in the fovea itself, because previously we were looking at a more parafoveal uh, region. So uh, this data are taken from another animal where we imaged directly from the fovea. And here we presented the stimuli very close to uh, the fovea itself. And uh, the stimuli themselves are, are uh, very small, are 0.8 degrees. And note that the contour over here is just one pixel width. So this is very fine contour. And over here, we can see the VSD response to this kind of uh, visual stimuli. And you can see that the circle over here appears over the cortex with the voltage sensitive dye response. It appears in elliptical shape where we can clearly see in the middle a hole. The triangle indeed looks like a triangle. This is the head of the triangle. This is this corner over here, and this is the base of the triangle. And this is a rotated square, I guess, that you can see here also uh, a square, which is a little bit distorted, and we can clearly see the corners of the square. We then presented also letters. So this is the letter A in V1. This is the letter N. You can clearly see it. And this is the letter L uh, in, in the fovea and of V1. Uh, we then wanted to use a forward world model where we take the visual stimulus and then we convolve it with a point spread function, apply nonlinearity so uh, it can mimic the voltage sensitive dye uh, signal in the sense that the voltage sensitive dye signal shows both sub threshold and super threshold activity, and then apply retinotopic transformation so we can see the predicted cortical image. And we wanted to ask what is the relation between um, the observed responses shown over here, and these are the predicted responses over here. So you see that um, in some cases we have um, good correspondence between the observed response and the prediction. Um, this is for th this. This is the predicted responses for the letters, and these are the uh, actual uh, image responses from the voltage sensitive dyes. And um, 
I will not uh, discuss uh, the uh, in details in the in uh, of the quantification, but in general, I mentioned that um, in many cases the predictions are similar to the evoked patterns. Where if we look into very small shapes, then similarity decreases, and there are some regions where we see less activation, like um, near the vertical meridian, and that the uh, uh, predicted uh, maps or predicted the patterns were correlated with the uh, measured responses. Uh, the correlation is given uh, over here. And if we looked into the single trials, uh, the correlation decreased somewhat, but this has to do with the noise that appears in, in, in single trials. Um, so the next the next step that uh, we wanted uh, to do is actually look into uh, the V1 activity over here, the maps that are evoked by these contour stimuli, and then use the inverse model in order to reconstruct the stimulus pixel by pixel. So uh, what we did, we uh, applied the reverse reti retinotopy. So we shifted from cortical surface to the visual field, apply nonlinearity so we can stay only with the, the high activity, and then deconvolve the point spread function and got uh, this activity over here, which is the reconstructed stimulus. And now we can take an example uh, from one animal. So this is the VSD response, which appears in V1. This is the reconstructed stimulus, and this is the original stimulus. And you can see that uh, there is a high correlation between the reconstructed stimulus and the original stimulus. We then uh, also looked in, in more foveal location, um, and uh, once again, these are the um, uh, type of contours that uh, we presented to the animal. Uh, these are the voltage sensitive dye responses that were measured from this animal. And uh, this is the reconstructed stimulus uh, using the inverse uh, model. And you can see clear correlation between the reconstructed stimulus. Here is a circle. Over here, we can see a triangle where we presented actually a triangle, and over here um, uh, we can see a, a rotated uh, square. Um, now we were wondering uh, whether uh, we can actually reconstruct uh, these images also from single trials and not only from data that was actually averaged across single trials. So um, over here, you can see again, example for the stimuli that were presented to the animal. This is the reconstruction uh, from a, an average uh, across trial in a single session. And these are the individual single trials. So we can see here a large variability. In some cases, the reconstruction is really good. In some cases, you can see that uh, there are missing parts um, uh, of the shape. And this has to do with the variability. Uh, that we see at the single trial level. Um, so uh, we wanted to um, quantify the reconstruction performance. So uh, what we did, we correlated between the uh, reconstructed stimulus and the original stimulus. This is shown over here. This is for the uh, averaged um, data, and this is for the single trial. And you can see here the uh, correlation values. And we also looked as uh, we also looked at the correlation as function uh, of time. And what we can see is that the correlation arrives to a, a steady value starting around 100 millisecond after the visual stimulus onset, which is what would one actually expect uh, to see in the primary visual cortex? Okay, so uh, the next thing that uh, we wanted to start uh, to add into this model is actually the temporal dimension, because when a stimulus appears, it appears for a certain time on the screen. In this case, that was the triangle, and then we can see the voltage sensitive dye response in the primary visual cortex. So, for example, if we show a circle, then uh, we have a response that uh, is changing uh, across time in the primary visual cortex. And we wanted to add this into a, a model. So uh, we developed a, a temporal uh, kernel. And, and now uh, we can actually uh, compare the response to the prediction in the triangle case. And um, over here, we can see the voltage sensitive dye maps, and these are the predicted response. And we can compute spatial correlation between individual frames over here to the predicted response. And the spatial correlation is shown over here as a function of time. We can also compute temporal correlation between individual pixels as a function of time between the VSDI and the predicted data. And again, the correlation uh, is shown uh, over here. 
Um, we then wanted to do it also not only on the encoding uh, direction, but also on the decoding direction. So this shows the stimulus and the reconstruction as function uh, of time. Uh, these are again the detailed uh, um, uh, reconstructed uh, stimuli. Uh, over here as function of time, and these are the original stimuli. So we can see that the reconstruction can be done in time uh, also in a reasonable uh, good manner. And um, over here, I'd like to show you where we're, we're, he we're heading to. So um, usually stimuli um, in the real world are not really stationary, so they, they, uh, they usually move. So the next step that we did, we employed a sequence stimuli where we had um, several stimuli appearing over the screen, one after the other. So we had a circle, a circle and then a rotated triangle. Note that uh, these shapes are starting further away from the fovea, arriving towards the fovea. And now let's see the, uh, the neural response um, over here. So what we can see is activity over here. It then gets to here and closer to the fovea. I'll show this again. We can see a circle, a circle, and a rotated, uh, and a rotated um, square. Um, so now using uh, the um, uh, forward model with uh, the, the spatial encoder together with the temporal kernel, uh, we can uh, compare the response to the prediction uh, in, this in this case of a sequence uh, stimuli. And um, um, the comparison between the two shows a, a relatively a good correlation. So we're heading towards um, movement uh, reconstruction, hopefully more realistic um, movement of object in the world. Okay, so what I would like now to do is um, refer to um, uh, rodents, which are uh, really um, great experimental uh, animals, and were recently uh, started to be very popular also in studying the, the visual system, and specifically um, studying the mouse uh, visual um, areas holds um, some unique advantages. For example, you can see multiple areas, and uh, obviously you can do uh, optostimulation and optogenetics uh, much easier than uh, in what you can do with uh, uh, with monkeys. So we were wondering whether uh, if we will um, um, present to uh, the visual cortex of slightly uh, anesthetized mice, if we will present them um, contour, very large contour, contour shapes, we will be able to see um, anything that is similar to what we see in the fovea of, of monkeys. So this is just a reminder for the voltage sensitive dye maps um, that uh, we image in the fovea of monkeys. Again, these stimuli are the size of Point eight degree, and uh, these uh, images are taken from uh, the mouse uh, visual system, um, using again voltage sensitive dye. So um, uh, the mouse uh, were presented with a screen, and on this screen, just for tinotopic uh, purpose, we first um, uh, image the different edges of a square the size of forty degrees, and you can see the different locations of these retinotopic uh, points uh, over the, the screen. And the small circles that you see here are actually standing for the location of the upper edge and the lower edge uh, of, of uh, this square over here. So these are gen general pointers for us in relation to the retinotopic mapping in, in this animal. And then we presented to the animals these uh, different contours at the size of uh, 40 degrees. And over here, you can see the time development of the voltage sensitive dice. These are the average map. And um, so what we see when we look into the, the, the visual um, products of mice, we, we can see here large activation in the primary visual cortex. These are all extra striate areas in the mouse visual cortex. And um, the blobs that appears over here um, are quite similar between the different uh, shapes. Interestingly, if you look here in the middle, where one should actually see a hole, as we see, for example, in monkeys, we don't see much, we don't see a hole. In fact, if we perform a ring analysis and we look here in the middle, we can see that activation is highest in the middle and uh, is uh, getting lower as we go away from, uh, from this uh, uh, location. So, um, this is again quantified over here, and it's very different from what we see uh, from the fovea of, of monkeys. So um, let me um, summarize as, at this point. So um, 
regarding surfaces, um, what we showed that is in terms of surface encoding, we show that this is edge dominated response and um, it appears early after stimulus onset, this edge dominated response and there's a hole in the, cent at the center. Uh, we have evidence for neuronal filling in that propagate from the edges to the center and the propagation speed is within the range of horizontal connection suggesting that indeed information is coming from the edges towards the center. Uh, of the surface. In terms of encoding shape contours and reconstruction, um, so what we showed is that we are able to perform reconstruction of shape contours via brain-like modeling um, uh, at very high resolution, sub-degree resolution, and uh, using cortical data that is comprised from voltage sensitive dye uh, signal. The current model is, is too simple. This is clear. It comprised from contrast, nonlinearity, and retinotopy. Nevertheless, for this very simple shapes, it is working. The time domain, as you saw, is in progress. And I hope that this will have some implication for the generation of artificial vision um, uh, in the cortex. So the next uh, topic that I would like to speak about is electrical stimulation in the primary visual cortex. Um, so, um, Electrical stimulation of the occipital cortex and particularly in the primary visual cortex of humans and monkeys is known to cause the appearance of uh, phosphine, uh, which is the sensation of visualization, if you wish, uh, of a small point of uh, light. And over here, uh, we can see uh, the famous patient from a uh, Dubell study where he had uh, implanted a, a electrode in the occipital lobe for, uh, for a very long period of time. And um, the, the main motivation was that, well, there is an extensive body of research regarding the behavioral effect of electrical stimulation. Little is known about the effects of ICMS on spatiotemporal patterns of V1 responses, as well as on uh, other visual areas. And so the research question that we wanted to ask is what are the spatiotemporal patterns of neuronal population evoked by ICMS and what is their relationship um, to the responses evoked by visual stimulation um, and to the saccades that are also generated by uh, microstimulation. So this is the experimental setup. This time we combine the voltage sensitive dye imaging to, together with a microstimulation. Here's an electrode that is inserted into the primary visual cortex and we applied um, uh, microstimulation using uh, biphasic uh, train responses and uh, train duration, sorry. And uh, we also um, used a visual simulation of a Gabor, which is shown over here, uh, in order to compare the uh, ICMS evoked responses to the visual simulation. So let me start with the first part over here, and this is the spatial temporal uh, properties of V1 responses to ICMS at varying train duration. So um, uh, this session is an example session from one animal. Um, the stimulating electrode is positioned over here. And you can see that immediately following the ICMS onset, uh, there's increase of activation. In this case, the, um, uh, uh, the white and, and pink colors are standing for high depolarization and the green one are, are actually standing for no change. Uh, so you can see over here that around the microelectrode, we get this blob of activation, which is spreading over several millimeters in the primary visual cortex. And when the ICMS is turned off, you can see that um, activation actually is dropping uh, down. This is the average voltage sensitive dye response. Um, average at, the, at peak response. And uh, over here, we look at the time course uh, of response of the voltage sensitive dye uh, at this region over here. And it shows you that um, during stimulation, population activity increased and a spread over several millimeters in uh, the primary uh, visual cortex. Um, here is another example from a different animal. Uh, in this case, the electrode was inserted over here. Uh, again, in V1, in this animal, we can see several visual areas, the primary visual cortex, secondary visual cortex, and area V4. And uh, we can see that shortly after the onset of the ICMS, there is a patch of activation in V1, but also over here in V2. And then on subsequent frame, this activation is spreading throughout V1 and also throughout V2. And once the uh, ICMS is turned off, we can see that uh, activity grows uh, declines back to uh, baseline. 
So this is the average voltage sensitive dye um, signal. And um, OMAP, and over here we can see the different regions in V1, in V2, and then also in, in V4. These are the different uh, ROIs that we took, and these are the time courses from these uh, different ROIs, and it shows you once again that once stimulation started, uh, response increased, and uh, it actually kept increasing through the entire stimulation, and when stimulation ended, uh, response decreases back to baseline. So, Interestingly, what we can see over here is that ICMS evoked activity that propagated along the hierarchical pathway to um, higher uh, visual areas. Um, this slide over here simply shows that the time to peak response uh, for the different train duration uh, uh, is uh, dependent linearly on the, on the train duration. So next we wanted to set the comparison between V1 responses to ICMS and uh, visual stimulation. So what we did over here, we presented this uh, very small Gabor and looked into the, voltage, into the evoked voltage sensitive dye uh, maps in the primary visual cortex. And what we can see is that following visual stimulus, we have um, some latency, which has to do with the fact that information is traveling from the retina to the primary visual cortex. And then we see here a blob of activation, very similar to what we saw in the ICMS, which is also spreading very similar uh, to what we saw with the, the ICMS. So this is again, the um, average voltage sensitive dye map at the peak responses. This is the time course of response of this visually uh, evoked uh, activity. Um, next, we wanted to actually compare more closely the dynamics of the response evoked by the ICMS and visual stimulation. So what we did over here, we uh, aligned the responses booked by ICMS and visual stimulation um, on the uh, response itself onset, okay? So uh, time zero is the response onset. And what you can see over here is that um, uh, the response to ICMS shows a faster rising phase than the response to visual stimulation. This is also true for the falling phase. So, once the visual stimulus is turned off and once the ICMS is turned off, you can see that the response though, the falling phase for the ICMS looks faster than for the visual uh, stimulation. So it seems that the ICMS has a faster response dynamics for both response onset and uh, offset. Uh, next one. Yes. Can I ask a yes. question about this? Sure. Yeah, sure. um, I wanted to ask when you do the um, ICMS or with the electrode stimulation, do you um, do you know which layer you are actually stimulating? Yeah, so we um, directed the electrode into the upper layers, layers two and three. But of course, when the current spread, um, it spreads around the microelectrode, uh, probably within layer two and three, maybe also getting into layer four. Because because layer four is mostly, well, let's say, um, uh, has lots of inputs. And I'm wondering why, uh, when you did the, 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 the ICMS, you saw, um, you saw uh, information uh, going into V2, and you didn't observe that with the visual stimulation, but we can keep that until later on. Oh, okay, so uh, it's a good question. This is just um, the, the reason, um, okay, so of course there's also activation in V2, you are completely right. The reason you don't see it over here is simply because this visual stimulus appears a little bit further away from the vertical meridian. Oh. So the part of V2 that we see over here is very close to the vertical meridian. I'll show you at the end of the talk, I brought specifically another example where you can see that, of course, local visual stimuli activate V1, but also, of course, V2. Um, this is only, simply to do the fact that uh, the visual stimulus over here appears a little bit further away from the vertical meridian. So it's buried, okay. the response is buried in the lunar surface. Okay, thanks. Okay, um, so the next thing that uh, we wanted to, to do is look into the spatial propagation. Um, so over here, we computed the derivative maps uh, for the visual and for the ICMS responses. The derivative maps are simply the response difference between uh, uh, two successive maps of the voltage sensitive dye signal. And um, we then took spatial cuts through this uh, derivative uh, maps. And what we see for the visual stimulus is that uh, once the response starts, you can see this hill of activation, which appears um, to grow 
And then um, later on, it appears to decrease in an equal manner. However, if we look into the ICMS, we can see that the special patterns is actually uh, different. And you can see that um, um, uh, further away with the, the, the uh, derivative uh, maps along the time, we can see that activity actually looks here like a ring with a hole in the middle. Um, and um, if we look into the spatial profile, we can clearly see this. So again, at early uh, derivative maps, we can see this hill of activation, very similar to the visual stimulus. But later on, we can see that activity actually drops at the site of the electrode faster than um, at uh, the surrounding area, suggesting that following microstimulation, what actually occurs is that, is that you, you have like a propagating wave uh, over the, the, the primary visual cortex. And one, one can actually quantify this by measuring the uh, derivative amplitude at the center over here versus at the edge, which is over here. Uh, this is the center and the edge for the visual stimulus. And we have here two different clusters. This is for the visual stimulus where usually the center, the, the amplitude of the derivative at the center is higher than at the edge. And uh, this is the ICMS, which actually shows um, a different a different or an opposite behavior. Okay, what is the relationship between uh, V1 responses and saccade generation? And we know that microstimulation uh, in V1 of monkeys shows saccades which are directed to the receptive field location of the stimulated cortical area. This is an example from Tehovnik, and uh, it shows here the receptive field of the stimulated uh, neurons in V1, the, the left lower quadrant, and here are the evoked saccades. So we looked into a, our animal, and although they were trying to make fixation, you can see in this session, for example, that the animal uh, following microstimulation indeed makes saccades towards the stimulated area in the primary visual cortex. These are unstimulated trials where we don't see these uh, saccades uh, are being evoked. Um, this is um, in, a, in, a, in a different uh, animal. Um, so you can see that uh, this animal is actually making saccades to uh, the opposite direction. This simply has to do with the fact that we stimulated in the other hemisphere. And again, unstimulated trials don't show these saccades. Now, if you look into the saccade size, it is um, uh, quite similar. But in terms of latency, there's a, a large uh, variance uh, among, um, among the saccades that are generated by microstimulation in this case. Next, we wanted to study the relation between the voltage sensitive dye signal and the saccade uh, generation. So what we did, we took the trials where the animal made saccade to the receptive field and trials where the animal did not make saccade to the receptive field. Note that in both cases, um, microstimulation was applied. And these are the voltage sensitive dye signal uh, for the trials with the saccade to the receptive field with this, where, uh, versus no saccade. And what you can clearly see here is that the activation was higher and um, it, um, it spread over uh, a more cortical area in the primary visual cortex um, uh, when you compare the trials with saccade to the receptive field versus no saccade. And indeed, this is further confirmed by the time course of response that is shown over here. Um, trials with saccade to receptive field show higher activation than trials without the saccade to the receptive field. Uh, this is the grand average from uh, the two monkeys showing a similar phenomena. And finally, we also wanted to test whether uh, this difference between trials with saccade to the receptive field versus no saccade to the receptive field, whether we can also visualize them in, um, in, in additional visual areas. So we looked into uh, V1, but also in V2 and also in V4. Again, in saccade um, trials and compare them to trials without saccade. And you can see that uh, this difference appeared also in higher visual areas. Okay. now. Um, uh, using microstimulation is uh, is highly important, and uh, in fact, uh, the past year uh, there were uh, two important publications showing that microstimulation uh, in the visual cortex of uh, humans and monkeys can lead to um, 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 very good results in terms of uh, artificial vision. Uh, however, if we want to uh, stimulate specific population of neurons in the primary visual cortex, we need to um, uh, use optostimulation. And rodents are uh, really an excellent animal model to implement this uh, technology much easier than in monkeys. 
And um, especially if we wanted, and this is what we wanted, wanted to combine or to develop the, the combination of water sensitive dye imaging together uh, with opto stimulation. So we started with rodents. And what we show over here is the visual cortex of a rat. And this is the expression of channel two, uh, channel um, uh, rhodopsin two in the rat visual cortex in uh, pyramidal neurons. So the spread over here is of several millimeters. And then we applied a brief pulse of light uh, using um, fiber. Um, and over here, you can see the voltage sensitive dye response that appears following this uh, brief light stimulation. And the response is quite uh, widespread all over. And uh, we didn't look into this initial frame simply because we had a huge light artifact. And this is the grand average showing the opto stimulation from several uh, animals showing again, uh, increased response following this pulse of light and uh, or laser stimulation and uh, decrease towards baseline. This is the spatial extent of this uh, activity showing that uh, the spread of activity um, uh, appears over several millimeters. We next wanted actually to compare the opto stimulation to the ICMS. So this we did again in rodent this time, this is the barrel cortex. And um, over here, we um, injected the, the virus and wait for uh, expression. And then we took two uh, time periods, one where we uh, actually did the optostimulation experiment very shortly after the, uh, uh, the injection, which is uh, three or four weeks. And then uh, also uh, we waited a longer time, we call this the long experiment, where uh, we waited um, at least eight weeks after the, uh, the viral uh, injection. And what we saw is that when you um, give this pulse of light uh, for the case in which um, uh, there was um, limited expression of the virus. You can see local activation for the case where the, uh, there was a, a large expression of the virus. You can see a very large expression, a very large activation in the primary visual cortex, which also reminds what is happening in the ICMS in the micro simulation in this animal. Again, we can see uh, very large uh, activation. This is the ICMS at high frequency stimulation, so it can be uh, more similar to what we did with the opto stimulation. And indeed, when we uh, later on, when we compared the uh, voltage sensitive dye evoked response to the short um, um, uh, to the short experiment, namely the experiment where the expression um, was limited only for a few weeks, versus the experiment where the expression uh, took longer time. So we, we did the opto stimulation eight weeks after the injection. We can see that the ICMS actually in terms of time course of response is more similar to the uh, opto stimulation experiments that uh, were performed uh, after long time of expression uh, of the viral expression. This is a more detailed analysis, but essentially it is showing similar uh, things. So let me conclude this part. Um, so uh, the neural responses evoked by ICMA showed a spatial spread of a few millimeters, which is much larger than the expected by the current spread in uh, direct neural, neural activation. And ICMS evoked a response that propagated along the hierarchical pathway to the extrastriate cortical areas. ICMS and visually evoked responses showed similar properties with some differences. ICMS induced faster response dynamics with wave-like propagation of activity. And um, size comparison with the visually evoked responses, if we looked into activity, in, into the size of the activity patch that is generated by ICMS and, uh, and, and visual stimulation, we can estimate that uh, in our case, the, IC, the ICMS, uh, the perceived phosphine that was generated uh, by the ICMS is probably smaller than half a degree. And ICMS evoked the cards that were directed to the receptive field of the simulation site and the population response in these trials were higher than those measured for the trials uh, without the to the receptive field. And finally, the final uh, note, the final point that I've showed is that uh, uh, opto stimulation ICMS can be uh, compared, and it seems that the effect of opto stimulation are more similar to ICMS, uh, given the expression uh, uh, of um, the uh, channel rhodopsin within uh, the neurons in the primary visual cortex. Okay, so this brings me to the very last part of my talk, where I will briefly discuss perceptual processing of object and background. And I'll start 
uh, with a figure from background segregation and then I'll shift to figure from figure segregation. So uh, very briefly, um, we decided to study the figure down segregation using a contour integration process, which is a process uh, in which similarly oriented discrete element are perceptually grouped together as shown, for example, in this, in, in this figure over here. We can see here a series of cobores which uh, tends to bind together and, and generate the circular contour, although there's no physical connection between these uh, individual cobore elements. Um, uh, so contour integration uh, obeys the good continuation law of the Gestalt. It's a very fast and effective process. Now, if you embed this contour in a noisy background of randomly oriented and position cobore, you can see, interestingly, that this contour still pops out from the noisy background, leading to contour integration and figure ground segregation. So the question that we wanted to ask is, what are the neural mechanisms underlying figure from background segregation in this case? So the animals were actually trained to discriminate between images that included a contour versus non-contour uh, images. And when we looked into the voltage sensitive dye maps, what we saw at early time, so this is 60 to 80 milliseconds after the visual stimulus onset. What we saw um, in this very early time are patches of activation that actually are corresponding to the elements of the Gabor in the circle area and in the background area. So this is the part of the visual stimulus that we actually imaged in V1. And the elements over here belongs to the circle, the elements over here belong to the background. And there's not much difference between the contour and non-contour. However, 60 milliseconds later on, uh, we see that the, uh, the VSD pattern is completely changed. The population response is completely changed. And what we can see here is that in the circular area, namely in this area, or if you wish, in, in this region of the circular contour, we can see enhanced activity. So the figure is enhanced and the background is suppressed. Um, this pattern is unique for the contour, does not appear in the non-contour um, condition. And now we can define a measure of figure ground segregation, which is simply the response difference between the circle and the background in the two conditions. This can be plotted as a function of time. This is um, shown over here. So this is the figure ground segregation as a function of time. And it starts to develop uh, around 70 to 90 milliseconds after the visual stimulus onset, but arrives to a maximal response much later on. Please note that this figure ground segregation is comprised from both enhancement in the circle and suppression in the background. Uh, lastly, what I would like to show in relation to this study is that if you take the contour and start to jitter the element of the circle, and so you are controlling the saliency um, of the contour. Uh, so if you take and decrease the saliency of the contour, so uh, this is actually the x-axis over here, um, this is showing the decrease in the saliency of the contour. And then uh, uh, you measure the psychometric curve of the animal, which is what is the probability of contour detection. You can see that as in humans, monkeys um, tend to miss the contour as the saliency decreases. So this is for the uh, two animals over here. Now, if we look into the figure ground measure, uh, that um, I, I defined earlier, which is simply the response difference between the circle area and the background area. You can see that the figure ground measure is actually also decreasing with the orientation jitter or with the decrease in the saliency of the contour. And uh, there's a high correlation between the neurometric curve and the psychometric um, curve. So it seems like the figure ground modulation is related to contour saliency and to the behavioral report of the monkey. And we think this is a top-down influence rather just than just a local processing in the primary visual cortex. And uh, these are the last slides uh, in my talk where I would like to refer to a figure-figure segregation. So what happens when we show an object in the visual field. So we already know that if we show an object, a figure um, in the visual scene, so we expect that the neurons in V1, um, they would enhance their activity uh, compared to the background. Yeah, we just saw this in the previous slides. But what happens when we show two figures in the visual scene? So in this case, we expect also for enhanced activity for these two different figures. But 
Will they arrive to uh, similar amplitude levels, these two figures? And how can we differentiate between these two figures? Um, so what we did, we trained uh, the animals on a discrimination task. This time, the animals needed to discriminate between um, a visual scene or stimulus where it had two figures versus one figure. Uh, the two figures, we called it the separate stimulus. So essentially the animals saw, saw two different bars. And uh, in the one figure stimulus, the animal actually saw one uh, large uh, annulus uh, stimulus. And the stimulus itself was uh, comprised from uh, random dots that shared a common motion, direction of motion for the figure. And the direction of motion was opposite for the background. And in order to um, generate the one figure, what we did over here simply added connectors uh, over here. So essentially the animal needed to discriminate between what we call the separate or two figure stimulus to the connected or what we call the one figure uh, stimulus. And uh, I won't get into the details, but we verified that the animal indeed can generalize uh, over multiple uh, types of one figure versus what we call the two figures. And importantly, um, this is the part that we imaged in the primary visual cortex. And locally, you can see that in both cases, both bars appear simultaneously in, in our uh, V1 imaged area. And the local features of these bars are identical for the separate stimulus and for the um, connected stimulus. And uh, this is important because uh, what I will show you now is that the connectors which are located very remote from the location where we actually image don't affect. So essentially what we image in V1 are two bars that are either belong to one figure or to two different figures. Um, so over here, what you can see is just a retinotopic mapping of the top bar, the bottom bar, and that their connectors uh, did not have any effects over here. Um, so importantly, population response is not influenced by the remote con uh, connectors and reflect only the identical local features of the separate and connected conditions. And we now wanted to uh, understand, so what is happening when the animal is actually viewing two figures versus one figure with very similar local features. And we computed the separate, the separated, uh, the separate minus uh, connected uh, VSD response. And uh, what we saw is that the response for the top bar is actually enhanced, whereas the response to the bottom bar is actually uh, suppressed or lower. And this is the distribution of the uh, response amplitude in the pixels uh, in this differential map of the separate minus uh, connected. So we can see that in the top RI, the top bar, um, we can see increased activation uh, for the separate condition. In the lower bar, we can see that this activity over here is lower uh, relative to the connected condition. And in the middle, we can see that uh, there's no much difference between the two, um, the two conditions. This is all of this is uh, quantified and, and appear in the original paper. So um, I just want to mention that we then defined uh, uh, a measure for figure-figure segregation, which is simply the response difference of this differential map between the top bar to the bottom bar, which for us means that this is the um, discrimination between one to two figures and or the figure-figure measure, which I have discussed early uh, in my uh, introduction. And what we can see is that this measure actually developed 200 milliseconds following uh, the onset of the visual stimuli. And lastly, I would like to show that we uh, control the saliency of the separation between uh, two bars to one bars by controlling the direction and uh, the uh, direction of motion over here in the connectors. And um, this is the probability of detecting two bars versus the motion direction difference between the connectors and, and, and bars. And when the uh, motion direction difference is actually very similar, what the animal sees is just a single bar. So you can see that uh, for both animals, as uh, this difference grows to zero, the probability to detect the two bars actually decreases. And this is very well correlated with the figure Measure. So figure-figure measure is related to the separation silency, also to the behavioral report of the animal. So 
So this is the last slide of my talk uh, where I um, uh, summarize and conclude this uh, last topic of my, uh, my talk, um, and which, is, which had to do with the figure ground and figure, figure segregation. So population response of early time showed activation patches that are corresponding to the contour and background individual element. The figure ground modulation starts to develop uh, around 70 to 90 milliseconds, but arrived to peak around 250 milliseconds after the onset of the visual stimulus. And what we saw uh, in the figure ground modulation, we saw increased activity in the figure and suppressed activity in the background. So it seems like the figure and the background are labeled differently in terms of their amplitude. And this late modulation was correlated with the behavioral performance of the contour silency and the monkey's perceptual report. Um, in terms of the figure figure segregation, so uh, we imaged V1 population responses evoked by the two bar comprising either one or two figures, while the local properties were importantly similar. And what we found that in the separate condition, unlike in the connected condition, the population response of one bar is enhanced while the other is simultaneously suppressed. This divergent pattern developed around 200 milliseconds, which is later than the figure ground segregation. And what we wanted to suggest over here is that V1 is also involved in the labeling of each figures by setting a different amplitude difference to the uh, different objects. And we think that both this aspect, the figure ground and the figure, uh, figure modulation involve uh, top-down influences through uh, feedback connection. And this is, um, I would like to thank the uh, um, student who actually did this work um, um, uh, of the presentation that I showed you uh, today. So Eoz and Hadar Edelman and Shani did the microstimulation study, Gai Tzurabel and Amit Babayov did the reconstruction and encoding model. Um, Shani and Eve did uh, the mouse um, uh, data that uh, I, ha I have shown and Ariel Gilad did the studies that are related to figure ground and figure figure. Uh, segregation, and I'd like to thank you for your uh, patience. Thank you very much, Hamutal. I'd like to ask everybody to unmute yourself and give a, a big talk. It was very uh, interesting and great talk. Okay. And of course, I'll be happy to um, open the um, stage for questions. Um, I'm sure people, I mean, I myself have lots of questions, but I'll wait. Uh, I won't start. I'll let others um, start, of course. Yeah, I, I will start. Um, very interesting talk, of course. Um, I wonder if the duration of the stimulus has any impact. Uh, because I think that in, in all the presentations, all the experiments you report, the stimulus was still present while all this figure ground process or um, and um, decoding was uh, uh, done. And I wonder what happens when, if the stimulus is really brief, 10 milliseconds, yeah. is the same process happening? And wow. a related question, if it's during a long duration, is there any role for the drift, for the eye movements during this process? <laughs> I didn't get into eye movements. <laughs> Um, so I'll start with the second question. I don't know. Uh, I don't know if drift has any role in this. Uh, what we do know is that the uh, figure ground segregation and the figure figure segregation um, uh, appears across micro saccade. So if the animal is making a micro saccade or a saccade, you can still see um, the figure ground uh, segregation. This is one thing. So the figure ground is actually carried from one location to another, given in the microsecond. Um, in relation to uh, the stimulus duration, uh, this is a very interesting question. Actually, uh, we had a different study where we presented the uh, stimuli very briefly. It was a different task. It doesn't matter, the detail doesn't matter. But if you present the visual stimuli for a very short uh, period of time, uh, then what you see is actually a similar process that uh, continues without the visual stimulus. Uh -huh. So you don't, have, you don't have to get the visual stimulus over there 
directly physically uh, during the entire process. It is enough to present a visual stimulus for a, a very brief period of time, um, and and, um, and then and then you can still see this uh, this process, like figure ground, for example, mm -hmm. like the surprise, which means that the drift doesn't have any role in this because if the presentation is very brief, then you don't gain. Well, then, then we get then we get into a question: What is the role of a, of drift in 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 general? So, I mean, I mean, if the role of drift, for example, is to prevent an adaptation or certain type of adaptation, then if you're flashing a stimulus, uh, no wonder that you sort of like replace uh, uh, the drift uh, the drift processing. Um, it would be interesting, for example, to do a different experiment and, you know, um, some uh, of the PIs that are actually working with eye movements, uh, some of them can actually stabilize the image uh, over the retina. So it would be interesting, for example, to stabilize this picture during the eye movement and see what exactly is happening. So, for example, present these images and then stabilize it over the, uh, the retina and see what actually uh, is going on uh, when, when you stabilize the image and prevent, for example, uh, from the drift to occur or present from the uh, micro to occur and see how they affect the figure ground segregation and the figure figure segregation. And can you do that with your system? Oh, just... So yeah, so this is a, 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 another, another good, um, uh, very good question. Thank you for the question. <laughs> And yeah, so um, today with the, the very fast screens that we have, it is possible to close loops very fast with the eye, uh, with the eye movement. So I think that for the drift, this can be done. I'm not sure that with the micro saccade, you, you will have a complete closed loop at the resolution of milliseconds. You may have a delay of maybe few milliseconds relative to the microscope, but that might be even good enough to start understanding what, uh, what is going on. Thank you. Um, Hamutal, I also have a question. I wanna ask, um, I, I saw the, the reconstruction of the stimulus or the prediction, which is quite amazing. Um, and you're using uh, optical imaging, imaging, which is much, has much better, well, I'm not sure about spatial, but clearly temporal resolution than, for example, fMRI. Now, I know that the Gallant Lab from UC Berkeley, uh, I assume you know this, they showed they, yes. they, they did reconstruction of basically movies, uh, which are seemingly more complex than the stimuli that you are using, maybe less precise. But I wonder if you thought about trying to do that. And of course, that uh, stimulus is has motion and color and many, but if they succeeded, do you think you won't, I mean, why would that method won't work uh, in your, uh, in your, um, in yeah. your domain? So, um, yeah, I know, I, I know, I know Galant's work is really an amazing group. Um, and uh, interestingly, what, what they show is a reconstruction of motion in, in using um, fMRI data, the bold data. But I'd like to note two things. There's um, a major difference between uh, what we are doing and what they did. Uh, what they did in their movies, they used a prior. So um, this means that the as opposed to what we're trying to do in our lab is to use no assumption and to do a pixel-wise reconstruction. Whereas the Gallant's work, which is highly interesting and very influential, what they um, usually do, they implement all sorts of prior about the reconstruction. And so uh, they use prior knowledge when they do the, the reconstruction. So, um, so I they think, use constraints. They have some constraints, and they, it's not. Yes. So, okay. yeah. So, yeah. So, for example, they need to choose from specific categories. So, so they sort of like have different categories that are related to the stimulus, and then this has some has some influence on the reconstruction that are being done. But they are not doing pixel-wise 
uh, reconstruction like uh, what we are trying to do without any prior knowledge. Mm -hmm. And um, so this is something that uh, obviously we will have to um, think about in the future and try to see um, how and try to understand whether we can do reconstruction of motion um, and of natural images uh, without prior knowledge. Yeah, um, I, see. I, I, see. I think this is, yeah, I think this is highly complicated. And, and another question, do you think that you will be able to decode color uh, mm -hmm. from, I mean, because you did show that there is an issue of the, uh, different contrast, like if it's positive or negative, but I wonder if uh, if you can yeah. see, let's say, I don't know, green versus yeah. red, blue versus yellow. Let's start from the very, uh, you know, the, the, the ones that are opposing, whether these differences would be able, I, I'm just wondering. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, um, so I think that uh, in order to uh, decode color, one would probably have um, direct access to um, the color to, to read information either from the blobs or functional columns in V1 uh, that are linked with uh, that are linked with color. Um, the voted sensitive dye signal, at least as, as we use it currently, is a population signal, which means that it takes everything, um, it takes every fluorescence uh, photon that is coming from the pixel and then it simply sums it up. Now, if we want to discriminate it into different colors, we um, have to get access and information from very specific population of neurons that are, for example, uh, selective for uh, blue, yellow. Yeah, yeah. So I think that without it, we'll not be able to. I see. Okay. So, it, but you think it has to do with the resolution? So, if you had, let's say, higher spatial resolution or the imaging, if you would have higher spatial resolution of the method, then you might be able to obtain, let's say, columnar or from the blobs and the interblobs and more subtle uh, spatially located uh, inputs. Yeah, yeah. I think wow. that in this case, we need information coming from specific neuronal population. Uh, there are some development recently on genetically encoded voltage indicators that can be expressed um, in specific populations of, uh, of neurons, hopefully uh, the future and uh, technology in future will enable to do this also in monkeys because wow. colors are not really relevant in, in the mice. Yeah, yeah, definitely, yeah. Okay, thank you. I have a question. Mm -hmm. I want to, well, thank you for the talk. Uh, I have a question relating to the last part, the experiment with the two uh, elements as opposed to, so the unconnected versus connected. I didn't quite understand why the polarity of the two, the top and the bottom elements. So I understand that it was different, the top was positive, and, but why should that be? I mean, the experiment perceptually is symmetric, right? Is there a specific reason why it should go positive at the top and negative at the bottom as opposed to the other way around? Yeah. So uh, that, that's a good question. Um, um, that might be related to the fact that the top bar was more close to the fovea than the bottom bar. And um, this is one possibility. So um, it's, it's possible that uh, what we're seeing here is also related to um, the distance from uh, the fovea. This is one thing. The other thing is that we are conducting now additional experiments in, in our lab, trying to figure out exactly what you are referring to. Uh, so we're trying to um, um, use different patterns this time and see if indeed in, um, in, in every case we get um, this uh, difference between, uh, for example, um, one object, two object, three object, four object, or five object, if we can see the differences between them, and um, if this difference is function of the, of the distance from the fovea. 
Uh, we're not sure this is related or not, but we're trying now to uh, perform some more experiment and investigate this topic more. I think your, your question is highly relevant. I think it's, it's completely in, in its place. Okay, thank you. I also wanted to ask if you think that the differences between the um, activation uh, where you differentiated would be between the ones that had saccades and the ones that did not have saccades following that has to do with pre-saccadic attention? Mm, that's a very good question. Um, I think that there are several um, possible mechanisms that can cause this. It is possible for example, that when you do microstimulation activity is simply spread throughout the layers, arrive to, um, uh, to the lower layers. And you know, from the lower layers uh, in area V1, uh, there is direct um, output that is going to the superior colliculus that can generate actually a saccadic eye movement. Mm -hmm. um, so that would be the most sort of like uh, direct mechanism to generate the saccades. Um, however, I mentioned when, when, uh, when we uh, studied the saccades, I mentioned that the, the latency was quite a variable. And this made us thought that actually what is happening over here is something different than just direct activation of the superior colliculus. And we can think about two, two mechanisms. First, it is possible that um, in some of the trials, the uh, phosphine that was generated due to the microstimulation was simply brighter. And this drew mm. the monkey to make a saccade to this location. So this has to do with perceptual processing of the phosphine itself. But also what you're suggesting is quite relevant. So it is possible that when you do microstimulation, you actually draw attention to this location, and then the animal is making a saccadic eye wound. This is one of the reasons that we started to look into the higher areas is to understand exactly what is going on. Because for example, if this is a tension, we would expect the difference between these two groups of trials, um, the response difference between these two groups of trials, the trials with the saccades and the trials without the saccade, we would expect them, the difference to emerge maybe earlier than than only at, uh, at V1. So that's uh, a very relevant question. And we're looking into this also now. Okay, thank you. Very interesting. I have more questions, but I'll spare the, I'll, I'll, I'll continue in person because I have quite a few. Okay. Um, are there any additional questions? Um, so thanks again, Hamutal, for a wonderful talk, really beautiful work. Um, again, thank I hope you. everybody joins me in um, thanking. And um, we will meet next week with Gunter Zek at the same hour. We'll send the uh, information. And I hope that we will be able to put the recording of this talk online. We'll see if Hamutala agrees. <laughs> okay, thank you very much again. Okay, thank you very much for the great opportunity. Bye-bye. Bye, thank you.